Welcome to another episode and Lessons of Real Estate Show. I'm your host, Anthony Pinto, and we are absolutely thrilled to have you here today. Our guest today is Larry Pendleton. Larry is the Chief Financial Officer for Next Level Investments, LLC. Their mission is to help the community of Hampton Roads create and sustain generational wealth through real estate investing. Larry has had over 10 years of, of experience with accounting, taxing, taxes, and auditing as a CPA. He also brings over four years of real estate experience and has closed on multiple deals consisting of single family and multifamily properties. He is a proud father of two handsome sons, Larry the third and Wesley, and husband to a beautiful wife and mother, Whitney. Larry, welcome to the show. Appreciate it, Anthony. Thanks for having me. No problem, no, no problem. Yeah, it's it's been a while since we've talked, so it's good to definitely good to see you again. Yeah, yeah. How's uh, how's you got me? What you say? Yeah, good start. That's good. No, I was asking you going to the meetup uh, on Monday. Yeah, tomorrow, uh, yeah. It is tomorrow. These days are flying by. Yeah, man. No, it'll be good. I'm excited to see you there tomorrow. I think we've got a great lineup, so I think it'll go nice. well. But uh, how's the new baby going? Uh, it's uh, new baby stuff, so <laughs> we're, trying, we're trying to get the phase of, okay, we got to get him out of our bed and into his crib. So, uh, so another round of, of long nights. About, about to come up pretty soon. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, joys of fatherhood for sure. Yeah, I <laughs> unfortunately don't have the uh, experience yet, you know, uh, having a, a child, but, you know, it's it's always exciting to hear other people's experiences and what I look forward to eventually, so. <laughs> <laughs> so Nice. So, uh, Larry, so, um, you know, there's a little bit about your background so far in the Hampton Roads area, and you've lived in Norfolk your whole life, right? I was uh, born and raised in Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. Uh, Norfolk, if you're from the area, <laughs> um, went to went to Women Mary uh, for, for for college, uh, undergrad, and uh, got out. Did the uh, public accounting, got my CPA. Uh, did that for about uh, about eight, eight, ten, eight years, and then came into uh, internal audit work uh, in the area as well. And then started uh, my own tax bookkeeping company with my partner Terry on Conyers. Uh, PC Financial Services and tried to grow that and then um, he actually put the real estate bug uh, in my in my ear and tried to just take off since then so since 2016 is when um is when I first started like dabbling into real estate trying to figure out if I want to do flips single um, rentals all that all that good stuff so um, but yeah um, like I said mainly from the area didn't really I mean travel a bunch of places didn't really feel a, a feel a need to move anywhere and I mean once you get married and start having kids I mean all of our families are here all our friends are here so didn't really want to do the pick up and move and get adjusted to a whole new uh whole new city so here here we are awesome man awesome so so it sounds like you you know you typically you started with a, a typical um Kind of paths going from single family homes and flipping to this multifamily. So how, you know, so how did you get started with the single family homes and flipping and realize that that wasn't your intended path and move into multifamily? I think with like most people, you kind of just everyone just sees uh, just one house. They don't. Uh, we're kind of limited in our in our in our thinking, and I was in that same boat where seeing myself doing an apartment building was never a. Uh, never a realm of possibility so you kind of limit yourself to i'll just do a house and we'll, we'll, we'll flip houses because everyone gets enticed by the big checks um but cash flow is always an interest of mine so actually my first deal was a, a townhouse uh in norfolk uh, a three a three two and um two or three k loan for that uh, so about three and a half four percent down and include the renovations uh, still have that to this day. Uh, same tenants <laughs> to this day, and uh, I mean, it's, it's gone pretty well. And I mean, done done some flips, and some went bad, some went good. Uh, but then you start to meet more people, you start to read more, educate yourself more, and it's like, okay, I'm making a couple of net, I guess net cash flow, I'm making a couple of hundred dollars uh, a month uh, off of this one deal. But if anything happens, like all of that reserve, is, it can be wiped out. Um, I mean, I know the last summer the, the the HVAC went out, and it's the middle of July, and the lady has three kids, <laughs> and I, and I had to basically pay whatever I needed to pay, uh, getting 
uh, temp, uh, temporary air conditioning, uh, the portable uh, AC units in there just to kind of hold them off until we actually got someone in there to do the, replace the HVAC unit. Um, but then it's like, okay, if I had more cash flow underneath one roof, uh, that's more reserves I can put to a side, that's more cash flow I can have. And it's all about surrounding yourself. I think that the whole term of like your, your net worth, your network is your net worth like that, 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 that becomes truer and truer the more people that I meet who are doing a hundred plus unit apartment buildings and, um, or have huge portfolios and they have a team around them. They know, they know how the game works and it just starts with the education. Awesome, man. So, uh, yeah, so you started with, you know, wanted to, you kind of got that, that flipping bug. So you want to have a lot of capital built up and you just kind of realize that it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of work. You know, there's nothing really <laughs> passive about it. Um, Not at all. it is, it is great way to make uh, you know, a lot of money. And, and I think a lot of people get sucked into, to that aspect of it. You know, it's, it's, a, they get you know, talked about, you know, you can make money off of this real quick and then everything just kind of builds up. And the next thing you know, it's taking over your whole life and, um, it's, it's something I've, I've tried to avoid, but it's definitely been an enticing, um, an enticing thought to me as well. So, and then you made that transition into, to the buy and hold. And, you know, it seems to be really where your, your momentum is pushing you is sort of the buy and hold multifamily aspect of it. So you talked about having to reserve. So, uh, do you have any set, uh, like guidelines or rules that you set up for when you buy a property, how much reserves you set aside? Well, if I do a, uh, either between one and 20 units, depending how that how big the deal is. So if I do one between one and 20 units, I'll try to do between 30 and 35% reserves. Um, and the kind of detail of that is that includes uh, potential vacancies, repairs and maintenance, capital expenditures, property management. Um, I mean, it even includes taxes and insurance. So basically, uh, all expenses before you even consider the debt service uh, on, on, on the property if 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 we're going to get debt involved uh, in the beginning so I try to do 30 35 percent as a as a rough estimate rule of thumb just based off of a lot of my mentors and, and other people who are far beyond where I'm at are using and then anything above that try to stick to the 45 50 percent uh, reserve rule for for all of that and making sure that we have a the net cash flow is within the realm of what we're, what we're looking at as well as the return on investment. Gotcha. So do you, um, so when you're looking at properties then, you know, in the 20 units on up, do you typically use that as a benchmark for what your operation expenses will be? Yeah. So I think a lot of us use, uh, uh Michael Blanc, um, as his, all, all the rules of thumb that he comes with and try to do some additional research. Because uh, some things you can kind of find out, you can find what the taxes are, you can find what the insurance is, you can find what the what the what the typical warrior bill is in in a, in a particular area. But try to use those those rules of thumb, but just kind of help quickly analyze the deal. Nothing's going to be exact to a penny, uh, but uh, at least what I can have in place is okay. I need to be able to get through a certain number of deals. I need to be able to review as as a goal of mine review. 50 deals in a week and I can't go into a deep dive on every single one. I need to be able to know with the rules of thumbs in place, do I at least meet my cash flow and uh, uh, return on investment uh, uh, trick, uh, hit, hit points? And if not, then I just move on to the next one real quick. Okay. So uh, in terms of those rules of thumb and, you know, what kind of criteria you're looking for? So what, you know, everyone kind of has their own, um, I guess, gates that they, look at when the, whether it's cash on cash return IRR you know those kind of rules for how they're going to set up the the return so what are your typical returns that you like to see that you offer to your, to your investors and has that been successful for you well I personally for myself try to get between uh, at least 10 percent of return on investment if, if I'm bringing in other investors uh, I like to have that conversation with them of uh, figuring out uh, what type of returns they want to see. Um, you I mean, especially in this area, we have people coming from out of state who wants to invest in this area who are getting awful returns, like maybe one, two percent return on investment in their in their area or in their state. So they're looking to other areas to invest in. So they're they're fine with five, six percent. Like it is more than what they're getting, it's more than what's sitting in the bank. So it's really just getting an understanding from uh from anyone that wants to partner partner with me or partner with our team of 
the type of returns that you want to see, and then we can we can build the deal around that to ensure everyone is uh, everyone is satisfied with their what they're what they're getting. Gotcha. Perfect. That's interesting. It's you know I, I know a lot of people have a very set um, investor term. So you know we expect to give eight to ten percent or twelve or whatever that is. You know this is our RRR. You know this is the split we're going to do if it's like a syndication. But that's interesting that you're talking to the in, you're individually talking to each investor and getting what their expected returns could be. Um, I never really I never really thought about it like that, and, and that's a that's a good way to go about it. And I guess it, it also gives you a chance to get a, on a more personal level with those investors, figure out what their goals are, you know, figure out how how conservative or liberal they want to be, you know, how aggressive they want to be with the portfolio, the types of markets or investments that they're looking in. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely a good idea is to kind of get that that sense when you're talking with investors of what they what they want to do, right? Because uh, worst case scenario, you know, you you end up talking to an investor and they're going to drop a hundred thousand dollars with you, and they're only looking for a particular type of market or a particular type of asset, and that's not what you're dealing with at all, and you're both not on the same page, and then it ends up, you know, you end up ruining a relationship potentially, or you know, not working together and wasting everyone's time. So uh, yeah, I think that's definitely talking with an investor and getting what they want to do and what their thought process is and what their returns are like is is definitely a great idea. And, and I, I love hearing that, man. So, all right, so we're going to, well, uh, transition here into, you know, more about your investments. Um, so you've done a few deals. Uh, you've done some, you know, smaller multifamily and some and you're moving into larger multifamily. So tell me about your, your best investment, your worst investment, and what you learned from each. My best investment uh, will be a fourplex we got, um, we got in Norfolk. Uh, we actually got that in the, in the auction of, I guess a, a city auction, so the courthouse steps for forty thousand. Um, a lot of work was needed. Um, our budget was probably around one hundred fifty-five thousand. We actually will we'll wrap probably will wrap up in I mean, before probably definitely before the end of this year with the renovations and get down the market and rent it out. Um, but what I learned from that one is you can't you can't force a deal to happen because that deal. We didn't find that deal in the auction. We found a deal to a wholesaler. And the wholesaler, I mean, we knew what the market, uh, like conservatively what the market rental rates were, and they far exceeded uh, what our return on investment was going to be. But um, but it wouldn't have made sense that the price the wholesale was was, um, was selling at. And we kind of just kind of stuck, stuck to our guns and, um, and then come to find out just to do diligence that, it was going on auction the like the next week, um, and then able to go to the auction. It was only us and another bidder there, and able to outbid them and, and still come in twenty thousand less than what we wanted to, what we were willing to buy. That um, it's all about just kind of staying persistent along that process, and then along with that, because it was an auction and title searches, all that is always a bit iffy with your auctions. Um, just having to stay on people with the city <laughs> about where, where we at and getting special votes and all of that. And uh, it definitely helped that I had my partner Terry on with me with it at the time because uh, we, we basically tag team on different aspects of it. Uh, so I definitely learned the value of having a, a good a good team in place, uh, having particular standards and stuff to follow up on and being able to to uh, delegate things that, um, that either I don't have time or I'm, I'm not particularly good at. And delegation also becomes like, okay, this is, this is our team. Our team consists of this person doing this, I'm doing this, next person doing that, so forth and so forth. Um, so like I said, so with that, like the return that we would have gotten beforehand, now we're looking at like we're almost doubling what our expected returns are gonna be. Um, and that's still being conservative on what the potential rates can be in that in that area. So that that was that was very huge, uh, huge, huge for me along the way. Um, the worst deal I did was a flip. <laughs> um, uh, it was it was my was my first flip, and I think it kind of it kind of rolls into the lessons I learned from uh, the lessons I learned from that one actually helped me with the the fourplex, and it's really more about. Okay, do you have the right people around you? Do you have the right team around you? And stop trying to do everything and try to control everything because it's almost like holding sand. Like stuff is going to fall through the, the more the more you try to hold 
Um, but we definitely uh, came over budget. I mean, you always know sometimes go over budget, but we were way over budget when it came to uh, uh, came to renovations. Uh, stuff had to stall. We had to get other other investors involved, and and I said we was able to see that through. But we came up a one year uh, a one year flip, and typical flips and like, <laughs> renovations should be done two three months uh, if four. And it wasn't it wasn't a full a full gut either, um, but just just to, like having the proper team in place beforehand, knowing what you're getting into, knowing everybody's responsibilities, uh, and because that, that's how you can hold people accountable. If everyone doesn't really know what their roles are and have accepted those roles, people kind of go off doing their own things, and and that that was my fault because I was the the, the, the quote unquote leader, the lead of that of that engagement that was the, that the project I found, I put the deal, I put the numbers together, I tried to coordinate with every single person and, and it, it overwhelmed me and definitely affected uh, a lot of different uh, aspects of my life because I was still working full time, uh, I was still trying to learn a lot of this stuff and um, like, it's, like I said, for my family and friends, like everything became real stressed um about that and I'm, I'm i'm very fortunate that everything kind of got back into its proper order and that was kind of dead and gone and and we didn't completely lose our shirts on it but uh it kind of it kind of has me hesitant doing another flip I've, I've, i invested in other people who've done flips but like it's hard for me to sit there and try to do one again uh with that still in the back of my mind but i i understand why people get into the uh get into the flipping game <laughs> Yeah, for sure, man. And, you know, it, that's, that's a pretty harrowing flip, you know, over budget one year, it took the whole to flip. Were you able to return all the investors money as well? Were you yes. able to make any money off it? Okay. Well, that's yeah, good, turn, all, yeah, turn all the investors money. I made no money. I, I lost money on it. Um, but I said, fortunately it said it didn't affect, um, like affect me too much uh it did i mean no one wants to lose money but i like to I like to think of it as that i gain uh, a lot of experience and a lot of exposure to the to the real estate game with it so i, I try not to think from a negative aspect of it uh but it's like i said it, it, it took a strain on a lot of different uh parts of my life where it's like okay I, i'm not gonna be scarred forever but and i survived but like, okay I'm, I'm gonna be a little more hesitant be a little more aggressive with my numbers Mm -hmm. um on, on on the on the next flip on whatever deal i do going forward yeah i mean and, and that's that's great that you're able to, to stick with it you know uh other people would have been like you know th this is uh this is what real estate investing is like you know this is this one flip and i lost money on it and i'm never going to do anything like this again and they just get out <laughs> you know and, and it's really a testament to your to your will and what you learn from it um and you know it it, it's only really failure if you fail to learn from it, right? So right. <laughs> you know, in this case, you learn a lot of lessons, and, and that's awesome. And I'm sure you're taking those lessons. It seems like the, you took in those same lessons you learned from your flip and applying to your quads and moving forward with running your numbers and delegation and all those thing, all those wickets that you didn't hit, you know, with your with your flip and you're applying it to to future deals and as you move forward. And that and that's great, you know. And and we um, we had a similar situation on a triplex that uh, we bought, and. Um, you know, at the time, you know, it looked like a great investment, you know, it's going to cash flow right off the bat, you know, from day one. And it turned out that it was a, you end up putting a, you know, tens of thousands of dollars more into this property than we originally intended. And, you know, it, it looked for a long time, like it was going to be a lemon, but you know, I, I, I tell people that I would have rather learned, you know, $10,000 worth of lessons from this one property than a hundred thousand dollars worth of lessons from a 30 unit or a 300 unit. Right. <laughs> so, uh, it, it sucks in the moment, but you know, we're never going to really learn unless we have these things happen. Right. You never, right. Gonna, you're never going to see how you're going to react in, in the, in a crisis unless that crisis actually happens. And, you know, it sucks at the time, but at the end you end up growing stronger from it. Right. And you end up learning these lessons, learned that other people who have just had success, success, success in all in a row, you know, never really get that opportunity to kind of hit. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that's great that you're able to, to take those lessons and continue building on it for sure. And, um, yeah, going back to your, to your quad, you know, sticking to the numbers. I, I just, I see this all the time when I'm looking at properties is just, you know, people are, are willing to, you know, you know, they, they have these set goals of like eight to 10% or 12% or something like that. And then they just start kind of start whittling away, whittling away, whittling away at it to an attempt to try and get a deal. Right. 
And it's just, it's just crazy, you know, how, how far you're able to compromise, you know, and get a deal just to get a deal under your belt, right? Or just to get a deal under contract, you know, much less actually close on it. And um, yeah, I think sticking to the numbers is absolutely vital, especially in this market, you know, when cap rates are just going through the roof right now and people are spending outrageous amounts of money on, on deals, you know, millions of dollars more than they should. And, and you're thinking like, how could they, how could they ever make any amount of money off of this or make any returns? And, you know, I, I think it, you know, now at, at this time, it's absolutely vital to stick to your numbers and stick to your guns because, you know, worst comes to worst, you know, it, you know, you buy the property and you have all these high lofty goals and then nothing like that actually happens. And you're right. stuck holding, you're stuck holding a limit that's millions of dollars worth of property and you have investors you have to answer to. You have contractors you need to answer to. You have, you have tenants you need to answer to, right? You have all these people that are now expecting you to, to give them the world and, you know, you didn't stick to your numbers and now you can't meet those returns. And it's just a bad situation overall. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's definitely great sticking with sticking with the numbers. Uh, yeah, it could definitely definitely hurt you if you don't do that. So, um, all right. So, Larry, um, so so the, you got into a, a flip and then you got into a quad. Um, are you moving into larger multifamily now? What what's on the horizon for you? Yeah, we're uh, we're looking into the larger multifamilies. Uh, twenty five, the one twenty five units is what we agreed upon. Um, I'm also uh, like the, the the company that we we set up the quiet with, which is really a CP Realty, uh, we also are are still getting into the duplexes and quads because there is a lot of people who want to get into real estate, um, don't have the necessary capital and means or, or the, the understanding of how to. Um, but this is our way to okay, we still got the bigger picture in mind with the larger units, but okay, this person only only may have a a couple of thousand or they, don't, or they don't know how to pull money out of their IRA or know how to use the money from their home equity line of credit. So that's, it almost, I won't say it's an educational program, but it, it allows us to still communicate with those that don't have 30, 40, $50,000 to put into a deal. They, they may have just 10 or five. Okay. Let's bring them on. Let's kind of show them, show them what, what we, what we do, how we, how we run the numbers. Um, get the deal and the contract, so forth, get the con uh, contractors in place. So, we, so we're kind of playing on both sides of, okay, let's, let's get more people educated. I feel like it becomes more financial literacy uh, type of view of it. And once people feel comfortable with these smaller deals, okay, we may have set up our investor pool for, for larger deals. And we'll still keep, we'll still keep interviewing me and, um, meeting up with investors uh, as well who, who can put into the larger deals and be part of syndications. But we want to, we want to kind of bring the masses with us um, as, as we continue to grow as well. Yeah, that's great, man. You know, pulling, pulling others up by the bootstraps and, and, you know, sharing the lessons learned to, to help others. That's, you know, that's, I think that's absolutely vital is, you know, providing that educational opportunity and giving your lessons learned and telling people, you know, what, not only giving them the lessons learned that you have, but telling them what you're doing now and what you're doing in the future, right? And I think that that's absolutely vital is branding yourself. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people fully, you know, fully grasp what that what that fully entitled is doing. You know, you don't you don't need to put you know your your name on a whole bunch of coffee cups and give them out all the time and, and make a whole bunch of merchandise and stuff. You can just add value to people, right? Adding value is it can be simple. It can be asking questions. It could be providing educational content, right? It could be running the numbers. It could be walking a property with someone and just showing them the things that, you know, you saw on your properties that were red flags or good things to, to talk about. Right. Um, yeah. I and mean, it's just providing value can be, can be simple. Can be, can, I think it's, it's absolutely vital because now you provided that value to someone and now they th they associate you with that property or that type of investment. Right. And now they're going to come back to you with more and more and potentially even be to be investors. So yeah, I think, I think that's great is it's, moving up that, that next step with your branding continuously, you know, putting, putting what you're doing out there to people so that, you know, when the time comes around where you're getting into a hundred unit property, now these people know that, you know, you're the real deal. You've been, you've been continuously doing deals. You know, they know that you know what you're doing and they would be willing to invest with you. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Awesome. Any particular markets you're looking in right now? Um, I, saying, I know, I know me and you to discuss about Kansas city. Um, I mean, Jacksonville, Florida is another particular market uh, that, that that we've been looking into. 
uh, we're always intrigued with Hampton Roads because of how transit it is. It kind of uh, kind of makes itself into its own rental market as well. I know people like moving here, but with the the bases and the, the universities and colleges, um, as well as the the, the different beaches, uh, Hampton Roads is always on our on our on our radar as well. So, and then. Um, uh, looking into Tennessee, Chattanooga, uh, which is there a couple of weeks ago, and there's a lot of jobs uh, moving moving in that direction. So connecting with a few people down there, um, as well as in um, uh, my mentor in in Atlanta, more in the Augustus area, um, as well as um, Texas. Texas seems to be the <laughs> be the next the next big thing with sure. so many so many jobs heading that way, no state tax. Um, so it just it, it draws a lot of people in 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 that in that in that way because they're they are really um, employer friendly, which also leads to being rather rather uh, landlord friendly as well. Interesting. So it sounds like you've definitely done your research on these on these particular markets, and uh, you know really know what you're getting into. Um, yeah, that's great that you're sticking with your hometown, and continuously want to invest in that area. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. You you've been here all your life, so you know, continuously give back to the community. That's great. So. Right. Plus, as I said we 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 go into a lot of places where there there, there are people living there, and unfortunately, uh, there there's there's quite a few slumlords. Um, not only our area, but it's it's, it's all over the country. Um, but um, for to see people living in, in just terrible conditions and yeah. they say, I mean, the landlord's trying to sell, and you talk to the tenants and landlord doesn't respond do anything or they, they there's leaks in the house or whatever and it's like why 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 treat people that way i mean you don't have, you don't have to break your back but it, i say it starts with um making sure you like you're an ethical person and then you have your numbers and and the funds in place where okay if someone needs a repair it doesn't always have to be it doesn't have to be top notch like a class work but uh, uh but as long as you provide people a clean, safe place to live at, um, they'll 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 treat it well. Um, but I mean, as soon as you just start disappearing on them or just letting just just let issues that's out of their control, uh, like I said the power goes out or there's there's a hole in 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 the, in the roof or hole from one unit to the next unit. I'm speaking on stuff that, that that I've seen personally, and people are willing to to, to live live through that because they want a roof over their head, um, and that and and it's in the, and the rent is cheap, but it doesn't have to be the cheapest and be cheap quality as well. So, um, and I know it all is all balances along the way, but you can provide people a good place to live at and 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 be respectful of the fact that there's 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 a human being here let's, let's let's give them some decent conditions to live in at least yeah no i mean that's that's great um you know it, have providing a quality safe place for your tenants is, is just, i think it's absolutely vital you know it's this may be a business and you may be making money off of you know your tenants living in a safe place but at the same time like if those tenants don't want to live there and they decide to move out like now you have no now you're talking with vacancy right so you know, instead of just drawing out all the money from the property, you can actually put it back into it, right? Create a community, right? Create an area that's safe, you know, that people want to come live in, right? You know, it's helpful for the tenants and for you, right? You're going to lower your vacancy. You're going to have less issues with, you know, turnover. All those all those things that, you know, it, it saves money in the end, but it's also just a decent thing to do to help people. Be integritous when you're dealing with people and providing the safe, affordable housing. Yeah, I think that's I think it's absolutely vital. And, and I've seen some some crazy properties that, it just it blows my mind, not only how people are living in those conditions, but why the landlord is allowing people to live in those conditions. You know. Um, all right, Larry, uh, we're going to get into the uh, snapshot round. You ready? Let's go. All right, man, here we go. All right, Larry, what is the number one thing you need as a new investor to get started? Education. Uh, if, if you don't have that, you don't have the basis to, to truly understand um, – like where the money and the capital will come from, how to structure a deal, how to um, how to make a proper offer on the deal, like how like what returns are you going to get, so forth and so forth. All of that is the basis on how you're educating yourself, whether you're paying for it um, through seminars or classes, or you find a mentor, 
whatever, reading audio books or podcasts. You have to you have to fill yourself with edu- education first before before you can actually get into it. Perfect. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely vital. Education, knowledge. Yeah, so you know what you're talking about. All right. Uh, second question: What is one nugget of investing knowledge you want to give us? I think you mentioned before that. Um, like, yeah, there's money and there's these buildings, but at the end of the day, real estate is a is a people, it's a people business. Um, you're 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 dealing with with your team. Um, you can't do this by yourself. I think we get caught up and to what can I do or can I do this or how can I do this? It's it's really more like okay, how can I help my team in place? Um, so if you have the proper team in place, that will. Um, help you get along the way. So this also includes like, how you're networking. Are you, are you networking with people who's on this um, on the same level or on, in, a, in, a, in a level greater than where you where you are or you want to strive to that? You need to get around more people like that. So, and then so you have your tenants or people that's going to buy your home if you're, if you're going to be flipping. You have the sellers. So there's, there's, all, these, there's all these people in place that you, you can't really get caught up in the money you got. You really have to make sure your personal skills and you're being a genuine person uh, along along the way because people people will see right through that. And like I said, there's there's always going to be bad bad apples in every bunch. So there's there's a lot of people in the game that don't really understand that aspect of it. But it's mm-hmm. like I said, it's people first, and then worry about all the other the numbers and the buildings after that. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. All right. And then last question: What is your dream? My dream is to actually be able to 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 teach financial literacy like through through real estate. And there, there's a lot of people out there doing it already, even locally. I mean, you have um, people like Chris Haskins. I think he's out of Hampton. Um, he's doing it, but it doesn't doesn't mean that more people can't provide that. Um, and I'm, I'm not. I mean, I may not do a podcast. I may not do a book, but maybe I'll do it on just okay. Here's how we do our deals, like one on one, like just kind of finding, like finding what's effective for me, um, in order to provide, uh, provide that service to be able to give back, um, uh, give give back to people in that aspect of it. Yeah, I, servant leadership. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, you know, I'm sure having having these lessons learned that you're getting, you know, going through these deals, um, having the financial freedom to be able to go around, talk with people, you know, um, not have to work at W2 and go travel the country and kind of spread the word. Yeah. I think that's, that's absolutely vital. I think a lot of, a lot of people, particularly in the military, just don't fully understand, you know, what it means to be financially literate. Right. Um, and much less how to get into real estate. So I think that's, that's great that you're, you're providing that service to people. That's really what it is. It's a, it's a service. You know, you're, you're taking what you're, what you're doing now and providing that to other people so that they can, you know, avoid the pitfalls that you ran into and grow upon what you've already built. Right. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's great. And so I'm glad to hear that, that, uh, you're, you're focusing on other people rather than, uh, you know, <laughs> find a brand new car or whatever. What, <laughs> You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I have a, a, a car on my vision board. Um, you know, I want to get one day, but you know, it's it's also being able to help people, and I and I think that's absolutely absolutely vital. So, all right, Larry. Well, I appreciate you coming on today. Uh, where can people learn more about you or contact you? Um, I'm I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Uh, uh, Larry Pellington on on Facebook. Uh, I need to change my Instagram name, so <laughs> I, need okay. to, I need to upgrade that. But you can find me on Facebook, um, or you can go to our website, nextlevelinvestmentsva.com. Uh, learn a bit more about myself, uh, my partners, Terrion Conyers and Don Carey III. Uh, and like I said, we're, we're slowly building that and getting our social media platform in place. Um, like I said, my or my email, my number, all that is up there. So um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I accept all calls, I accept all emails, and like I said, I'm just real, real intrigued to like talk to more people about this and 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 get them to a uh, the next step in their life as well. Perfect, man. Great. Well, we'll link that all in the show notes. And uh, yeah, you gave gave us a lot to think about in it, and you know this episode today, and. I appreciate you coming on today, Larry. You know, I'm excited to see you know, how you how you grow in the future. You know, you're already off to, to a great start, and you've been an inspiration to a lot of people. So continue doing what you're doing, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on eventually here 
when you're a billionaire real estate investor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I man. appreciate you, Anthony. Uh, looking forward to seeing how well these podcasts work out for you because uh, you're you're you're, uh, you're definitely providing a huge service with this and giving people the opportunity to kind of see and hear from other people. And I said there's a lot out there, but I think especially starting locally and then building out from there is very, very beneficial for, for a lot of people. I appreciate it, man. appreciate it. Yeah. You know, just, just trying to add value, man. Trying to add value best we can. So, all right, Larry. Well, I uh, appreciate you coming on and we'll see you next time.